All right, folks. Well, hopefully this will work. Um, I think we are good to go. And by my calculation, we're pretty much at 7 o'clock. So I want to make sure that we get started right on time and respect people's time. And we want to thank everybody for joining us for what is really a bit of an experiment for us this evening. And we're going to not only give it our the old college try, as they say, but hopefully learn and improve as we go. So as has become our custom, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement tonight and just recognize that Mission is located on the traditional territory of the Stolo peoples. And in specifics, we want to give thanks and respect to the Lakamal, Matsqui, Sumas, Kwantlen, and Scallops First Nations, whose people and ancestors have lived and stewarded this land for more than 10,000 years. So what are we going to do this evening as we try our first one of these? We're going to begin with an update for me about some of the things that are going on in the community. I'm going to do my best not to ramble on here. Uh, if you know me well, you know that is a challenge. Uh, I won't be able to touch on every single thing that's going on in the city, but as we are going along, if we uh, provoke a question from you, please put your questions in the comments because we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to answer those afterwards. As soon as we're done with the update, we're going to go into a Q&A mode and we're going to start with four questions that were sent in before the session and then we're going to be doing a bunch of questions uh, that you are typing in. I see folks have already been doing that in the comment section beneath the video feed and I'm joined here with uh, by today by Taryn Hubbard, our manager for communications and public en engagement. I had originally intended to turn the camera around but I don't think anybody can see anything except the screen right now so we won't do that. And Mike Uni. Uh, our CAO, who are both here to help tonight. And Taryn's going to help to get the questions to me that you're putting down below. And in many cases, your questions may actually be suggestions and comments, and we'll collate all those later on and pass them all on to staff and council as well. And Mike's going to be able to help me out with some of your technical questions. If something gets into a level of detail that deserves to be referred to one of our expert staff, for example, in engineering, We'll get those answers later and post them for you on engagemission.ca and our Facebook page and get you full answers. But Mike, between Mike and, and Taryn and myself, hopefully we can answer most of the questions tonight. We also want to recognize that many of our council members, in fact, I think probably all of them are, are tuning into this broadcast. And I want to not only thank them for being, uh, for doing so, so they can hear your questions and comments, but also because, to be honest with you, I've been a beneficiary of their leadership and their work. I was only elected last May, and uh, the council really is the one, are the ones who are responsible for a lot of the progress I'll be talking about tonight. And I want to give a, a, a nod, and a couple times throughout the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about specifics in those respects. I want to ask that people who are watching tonight let their neighbors know that even if they couldn't tune into it live, there will be a recording of the session. We may even be able to edit certain parts of it so we can pick, pull out some questions. I'm not sure yet we're working with this technology and we're going to try, but for sure the entire session will be here and uh, you'll have the benefit my wife has always wished for, which you'll be able to fast forward through the boring parts. All right, let's jump into the, that was funny, Mike and Taryn, you should have laughed, okay? <laughs> The update themes that we're going to cover off on. It's not progressing. Um, is it not progressing or is it because it's just a little bit behind, do you think? Were you, did you go on the land acknowledgement? I did. did. I, yeah, we're still on the, on the homepage. Okay, so we're kind of, I was wondering about that. So, folks, we're having a bit of difficulty with one thing. We well, did a dry run yesterday, but I'm going to, here's what I'm going to try. And it's, folks, I'm going to let you know I'm going to do something that's high risk. I'm going to close down the PowerPoint. If for some reason it does something to the Facebook live feed, don't go away. I'll get us right back on in a minute or two. But we're going to try this. I think we have to close the slideshow and try it again, Terrence. Yeah, we're good. Now, are you sure it's working? Not yet, no. Okay, we're good. It's, so okay. what's it showing now? Your update feed. <laughs> it's just slow. That's all it is, I think. It's slow, I think. All right. So I think there's some kind of a challenge, but I, I think what I'll do is I'll go back to play from current slide and Hopefully it's caught up by this point. So folks, I'm not sure if it's a if it's a lag time that's affecting us, but in any event, here are the themes we're going to cover off on. And again, thank you for your patience as we try to work on this technology. Uh, I think everybody can relate to what it's like to try and being good doing everything digitally this year uh, or this last two years. Some of the things I want to talk about in the update, organizational excellence, uh, infrastructure in the city, our planning department, our finance initiatives, civic engagement, and community wellness. So let's dive in. 
Uh, probably the thing most people notice is infrastructure investment. And I'm going to focus on three things right now. The first one we're going to talk about are our crosswalks and street improvements. And you might have noticed these on places like Draper Street near Hatsik Elementary. Uh, you might have noticed them on 7th Avenue, uh, Great State Lake Street, and Wren. And I have to say, I've been really impressed by most of these crosswalk improvements. Uh, they've not only made the experience for pedestrians far safer, but they've really had the impact of modernizing the streetscapes in those neighborhoods. And you see, particularly on Draper, where they've been combined with uh, uh, traffic calming measures. And I think it's been a very successful initiative. I know that others on council, I know Councillor Plekis in particular, has really talked a lot about making sure we continue that work and has support across all of council for that. So I expect that we'll see more of those as we move forward. Now, if you've driven up 14th Avenue lately, you probably cursed your city council, but please bear with us as I know that road feels like a piece of Swiss cheese as you go across it right now, but the good news is that all of that temporary disruption is a product of underground improvements and eventually above ground improvements on 14th and down to Heard because we're updating all of the underground servicing, the pipes underneath the ground there, but even better, when we're done, we're going to upgrade the actual 14th Avenue. So it'll be wider and safer, have upgraded safe, uh, sidewalks and a multi-use path for people who want to bike and skateboard and push a stroller along that roadway. And again, I think you'll see more and more of this. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move through the update. But 14th Avenue is really sort of the first foray into us catching up and modernizing some of our underground servicing and using that as an opportunity to really improve the driving and pedestrian experience on the roads around uh, those neighborhoods. Probably the biggest story for me is the sewer crossing force main. Uh, if, if you traveled over the uh, Mission Bridge, you've noticed no doubt that the area on what we uh, all familiarly know as the breach lands has been cleared and it's now being filled with dredged sand. And this is a, 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 a good news story on three bases. You've probably noticed the dredging rigs out there in the river. Thanks to a lot of collaboration between council, staff, landowners like the Brach family, different branches of government, including DFO, uh, we were able after many years, and we got to thank our MLAs and our MPs for the funding, particularly Pam Alexis for her pushing and Bob Dees for pushing for the funding that's helped us to install this force main uh, across the river. The reason this matters first and foremost is that our old pipe was at risk. It was so old of bursting and creating not only an interruption in sewer service, but more importantly, an environmental uh, disaster in terms of the river. So now that we'll be able to see this new force main installed and we're expecting that it'll be operational, I believe, Mike, by second quarter of 2022, is that what we're looking at right now? It's gonna, it'll probably need to go through a testing phase for the first little while, right? That's so yeah. so it'll be built in the mostly in the first quarter, but you'll actually hopefully see it online in the second. And then the next step is that we'll actually be able to inspect the pipe that's currently there and hopefully be able to, to do some work to, to maintain it and actually have it as a backup and have it for future capacity. So we could actually have a good news story that comes out of that. And then finally, of course, all that dredge sand is going on to the north shore of the river, raising that land above the floodplain. It's an opportunity for it to potentially develop and we think it's a, really a great stimulus. And I think, um, I don't wanna speak for, for the Brach family, but I think we're all excited about the opportunities that it will present there for those lands to be developed and to become particularly an employment, a source of employment. What's coming up? The 7th Avenue Greenway and street improvements on phase one. What does phase one mean? Phase one is the area from 7th and Grand east to Stave Lake Street. And uh, it's going to be the, 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 the pathway that we're talking will be in the north side of the street. And you probably heard lots of debate about this, lots of conversation about this. And I can tell you it was not an easy one for council and especially for me individually. Um, I really felt we needed to do a lot of homework to make sure that we were thinking about things like parking and making sure that we were um, truly adding value for everybody across the community. And I have to thank all of council for the work they've done here. It isn't something where we've all had the same sort of perspective on it, but at the end of the day, I think what we appreciated was the fact that we needed to go a, a, in a phased approach. So by doing that from, set, from Grand East, we will do an, uh, achieve a lot of benefits. First of all, we were able to qualify for a $500,000 grant through the province, through their active transportation granting program, and our staff are optimistic that we may be able to 
actually access other granting programs. And second of all, I, I think Council really advocated for this to be an opportunity to improve safety along the corridor, and particularly the 7th and Murray intersection, as well as to improve the, the, the front of the, the, the little mall at the T between James and uh, 7th Avenue. Many people don't realize that little mall is actually on city property. And um, we wanted to make sure it was not only safer to go in and out of the parking there, add to the parking there, improve the front of the building and the access to Heritage Park, or sorry, the Leisure Center Park from that neighborhood. So the Greenway is going to get started in the coming year uh, on that corridor. Uh, we didn't start it on the west side. Here's why. We want to learn from phase one. We want to make sure that if the school board is successful in seeing a new school get built on those properties, we will incorporate and work with them to make sure it fits there. And of course, people raised questions about parking where those local businesses are. So it will make sense in two ways if we can combine this with some type of, hopefully, some type of school down the road. Another one I want to talk about in terms of upcoming are some joint studies we're doing with ICBC on Dudney Trunk Road and the Canyon Israel Roads. Dudney Trunk, if you know it, you know it well, is a very historic road, but it was never designed to be a place for heavy traffic, uh, such as we see in the summertime when we get so many visitors up to Stave Falls and up to Steelhead. And so uh, the residents up there have highlighted for us a number of areas where they had concerns and our Public Works and Engineering Department uh, suggested that we work with ICBC to study that area and see where we might be able to implement some measures to improve traffic safety. And similarly, on Kenny Streets in Israel, near the sports park, roads that were never really envisioned as being throughways and have sort of become that. Now, these first two studies will lead to us doing some, some improvements, I'm, I'm sure, in the next couple of years there. And then I think we'll be looking at where can we continue to do these sort of spot studies. It's a great example of a place where if you have a comment, please put it into the comments or write an email to us so that we can think about whether or not other neighborhoods need the same sort of treatment. Organizational excellence will be the next theme for us. And I'm going to start with something that might be boring for some folks, which is software. But um, it's really important at a civic level, and especially when you consider the fact that our software is really so outdated that they haven't really been even making updates for it for some time. And so we needed to undertake to find what we call enterprise software that will allow us to uh, have a better and more secure experience for customers in the city who want to uh, do things like pay their taxes or find out more about what's happening with our finance department, submit an online application and so forth. So we really wanted to make sure that we were upgrading this and what the city has done is a couple of important things. First, we brought in a business analyst who's helped to take a look at creating software suites that are going to fit our needs, training our staff and bringing them online in a strategic way and applying for funding. So we got $500,000 through a UBCM granting program. And these are expensive pieces of software. We're talking in the neighborhood of, a, I think it's $2 million for each of the two major suites. Is that right, Mike? Yeah. I want to say $2 million. So they're, they have to last. They have to be able to grow with us because they represent a significant investment. And, and we've all started to realize, I think, during COVID, just how important it is for us to be able to have meaningful experiences without necessarily having face-to-face -face ones. And these software pieces will help people to see in real time what their applications are looking for like or how to pay for their services and so forth here. We also started a pilot project of using Office 365 down at Welton Commons. That's the downtown branch of the city. But if you think about it, there's so many different branches where city staff work, the ability for them to collaborate online, to share documents, to uh, collaborate on documents, to meet and to be easily um, work together in a digital space is critical. So that pilot project has led to us rolling out this Office 365 capacity in all of those other venues here at City Hall, our fire station will be there, the Leisure Center, and so on and so forth. So we'll look to do that over the next little while. And that should also help our staff to be consistent in their interactions with one another and to work with your applications and your questions in a more timely way. One of the biggest ones is adding staffing. Midway through the year last year, Council recognized the need to add to our building permits department. To give you an idea of the demand on the city's building permits, I believe it was the last four years we quadrupled, Mike, am I right? The last four years we quadrupled the value of land that's come before us for applications. Um, and I'm not sure about the timeline. It's been at least four years, but or sorry, at least over the four years. It might have been even less. 
but I do know it's increased by literally four times the value. And so we needed to keep aboard or keep abreast of that. And we added a building official, a plan checker, and an administrative assistant in that department. And we're slowly catching up there. It's a lot of work. We have staff coming in after hours, putting it over time, and they are working the proverbial butts off uh, to gradually get those times down. We use the single family developments as our benchmark and uh, it's a slow process, but you'll hear a couple of other things we're doing to try and expedite it. We also know that we need to um, find a way to bring an affordable housing strategy in that's going to work for um, all of the stakeholders in the community. So council approved a pilot of having a horse housing coordinator hired for the next year. We also have all gone through the experience of the last year of seeing what it can look like when weather or other disastrous conditions can displace people. And we've had, uh, we've been very lucky to have Monique Weir, our um, emergency social services worker on staff here, but we have asked her to be a full timer for us because that allows us to be much more prepared for the future and to work on prevention programs as well. She was incredibly valuable and we owe her and all of our fire rescue people, our search and rescue people, a huge debt because they not only helped in mission during the atmospheric river events we saw in late November or throughout November, but it also was tremendous help to the regional district and to our neighboring electoral areas. So we want to thank her as well. Our growth has meant we need to have a full-time fire inspector. We're adding one of those this year. And again, that will help us with not only making sure that new buildings are safe, but old buildings need to sometimes be improved as well as having our fire prevention programs. We hear from people all the time about concerns around traffic. So our traffic and engineering, our traffic department is adding a traffic technologist and engineers. And the great thing about those is those are essentially uh, funded through development cost charges and, and the fees, I should say, that are, are associated with development. So those are really being paid for by the very growth that necessitates them. Um, our deputy CAO, Barclay Pitkethley, has really been leading a process review for us here, which is looking at three key components. Uh, I call it the paper, even though a lot of the, the stuff we're working nowadays are online forms, but making sense of simplifying and expediting the processes people have to go through when they're filling in forms and dealing with the city, making sure that our people are ready for everything that comes before them. That includes our recruitment, that includes our training, that includes reviewing and evaluating performance, and also our processes, looking at what other cities are doing, looking at what agencies uh, that are experienced in advocacy, such as the Canadian Home Builders Association, are seeing done elsewhere. And looking at processes to make them as simple and logical as possible. So for example, one of the things that Tabarkley has us working on is something we call uncoupling or decoupling. So that if a, de if a person wants to come in here and make an application, they don't have to try and do the whole enchilada. They can work in smaller chunks. They can find out what the community is wanting, what city council is saying the community wants, and they can adjust along the way and work through things in a more logical step. The first letter I got to sign after being elected was a letter that went out to the six First Nations that share territory with us to let them know that Mission was taking a lead in adopting the principles of reconciliation. And again, I got to give credit to all of Council because the actual decision to adopt the principles of reconciliation happened before I was elected. But we are leading the charge in this. We understand that Mission's history in terms of engaging with First Nations is not an illustrious one. And so we want to be leaders in the reconciliation side of things. And that means being dedicated to learning. That means looking at opportunities for partnership in economy and education, for example, collaboration in major initiatives, and moving forward on the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission's calls to action. So some of the things that'll be upcoming there are in that area are we're going to be uh, looking towards creating a performance dashboard so that you can see the metrics the city has in place for our strategic plan. You would be able to go to our website and see how well are we doing at staying on budget? How well are we doing at keeping crime numbers low? How are we doing at building permits? How are we doing at meeting our targets for affordable housing? Just as a few examples. And we are, uh, I've been, I met yesterday with uh, our MP Brad Viss and he's had a lot of success uh, as have uh, Harrison, uh, Hot Springs and Kent at what they call a C to C table, a community to community table where they've sat down in their case with Chehalis and Scowlitz and, and their table works on 
issues of mutual concern, such as uh, preserving salmon habitat in the Fraser River. And we want to do something similar, so that's something uh, I'll be speaking to local First Nations about and to council about and trying to, to see us move forward on. A lot of the last three years and a lot of this year will be about establishing planning. In fact, that's probably a major theme. I would say that this council is focused on ensuring the plans for whatever the next council undertakes are done properly and comprehensively. And that includes utilities planning. Uh, for example, we have, I think, about 600 kilometers of, of piping underneath the ground. Am I right, Mike? I believe that was the number. And uh, 600 kilometers of piping and much of it was built in the late 1970s and what that means is a lot of it is coming to the end of its lifespan. We need to think about how do we replace that in a way that doesn't uh, put the community at risk but also doesn't financially expose us. Similarly, we know that people have major expectations around transportation in the community and in and out of the community. Things like transportation in the form of transit, active transportation, and of course um, the use of, of electric vehicles just as examples and so our transportation master plan is uh, underway and both of these will be wrapping up in the first half of 2022 and you have had some opportunities if you've been a uh, subscriber to engagedmission.ca to give your input and we'll be looking for that as well. Similarly, Central Neighborhood in Silverdale, this is the area uh, particularly uh, up Loftus and near uh, uh, Law Street in particular is where the first focal points have been and we've been working with local landowners on a small scale as well as Polygon and our staff will be coming forward uh, with Central Neighborhood Plan again in uh, a, a yet another version for us to then get closer to realizing the plan and asking for community input. So that work is very close and we really appreciate all the input we've had from members of the community on this as it's moved forward. More presently, even more early, I would say the first meeting of February, I think we are looking at, an, uh, at, at, looking at a, a plan uh, in, on the Stave Heights neighborhood, which you might have heard us refer to as Par Avenue. And before Christmas, we actually approved first reading, so that allowed us to get out and do some referrals, send things out to Westminster Abbey, to First Nations groups, to environmental groups, and to engage in a, lot, a number of public information meetings. We want to thank people who came to those or to the walkabout we did in the neighborhood. The next step is for us to um, put it before the community in the form of a public hearing. What I like about this particular development, what it gives us the opportunity to do, is to really be innovative. If you don't know the area, this is the area just west of Stake Lake Street and just at the foot of what uh, most of us call Mount Marianne, all the way down nearly to Prentice Avenue. And Council has taken a principle-based approach to looking at this particular neighborhood plan. And those principles have included the idea that development should result in safer and improved Stave Lake Street, another road that was built for old time use. And uh, it will be both a wider and safer road as well as one that will have a multi-use path and safer sidewalks for kids walking down to Windebank and uh, Ecole de, de Rive and, um, and Heritage Park uh, Middle School. It's also going to mean that there are trails and preserved green spaces along De Gomez Creek. Uh, it's going to allow us to have a trail network that connects all the way from Par Avenue down through De Gomez Creek and Fraser River Heritage Park down to Lougheed Highway and even to the Fraser River. And at the, at the top end of it, as a result of this, a beautiful park, about two hectare, hectares in size, that has a vista out to, uh, to the Fraser River, particularly to the southwest. So it'll be a destination park. And another exciting part for me is the idea that we're going to be building some innovative housing forms there that allow people to have choices if they want to age in place or for first time home buyers, uh, buyers I should say. We have some single family, but we'll have opportunities as well for people to live in, um, in different housing forms like townhomes and so forth there. And of course, everybody's been tuned into the waterfront plan. I probably don't need to tell you what's happening there because the subscription to those surveys and those um, public engagements has been very high. I think we had more than 800 survey responses the last one. And that plan is going to be realizing uh, coming forward in late May or potentially early June. And uh, it, the themes are clearly evident there in, the, in things like, for example, people wanting to see lots of employment, lots of access to the river, preserving the raceway's ability to be the raceway or even to improve itself, connection to the downtown, engagement with First Nations, and uh, public spaces. So all of those things 
are embedded in the, in the preferred land use plan that is in draft form right now. I had an opportunity to sit down with the Braitch family uh, and we really want to thank them because it was short timelines and to talk about how to make the preferred land use plan really fit the vision that they have as well. So I think you're going to be excited by what is possible down there. And when I say possible, it's not just what a council is dreaming of, but what's really been proofed out by uh, talking to developers and by doing the economic analysis down there. So I think we really are um, in a realistic position to see the waterfront develop. We have had tremendous engagement as well from other branches of government, including the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation, Minister of Municipal Affairs, and from First Nations. So we want to really thank all of those governments because there's a lot of collaboration that's going on there. So what's coming up? Well, all of these plans need to be integrated into one larger plan. Our official community plan is reaching its fifth birthday. It's supposed to last about five years, particularly when there's this much growth happening in the community. We really need to make sure that everything is laid out in a strategic order. So council's meeting near the end of actually January to talk about how do we fit these plans together and what's next for us? Do we have a growth management strategy? Do we have an official community plan uh, revision? We'd love to hear your thoughts on this. The environmental charter will be coming back before council here soon. Uh, Mike, you actually helped to create the very first one. Was it 2009? I want to say it was 09. Eight, eight, I 08. So that's even worse. We're, talk we're at 14 years for that document and we really have needed to update it. So our environmental services department has been doing that work. It'll look into things like trees, salmon habitat, and of course environmental impacts ar arising from climate change. And so I'm very excited to see that come forward and that will help to sort of give us a direction in terms of building in environmental policies and building capacity in the next few years. It's been far too long. Our Economic Development Committee is vetting an employment land strategy and that's coming to council very soon. This is exciting too. Many of you have heard me go on and on about how important it is that we create opportunities for people to live close to home, not be in their cars every day draining social and economic capital from our community but we want real living wage jobs and so the economic development committee is doing yeoman work by helping us to move this employment land strategy forward that'll come to council soon and we also will be working with the canadian home builders association local builders our own staff and our planning department and hopefully even some other communities to host a builder, a builder symposium we wanted to do this far earlier but uh, covid keeps getting in the way of us doing face-to-face -face things, which is why we thought we would try this tonight and and uh, we are committed to making sure that that symposium happens and we've been in conversation with the Canadian Home Builders Association who are very enthusiastic to partner with us. Our finance department, sometimes we overlook the importance of this department, but uh, it starts off with stuff that may not be all that exciting to people, but you may have heard a few years ago about examples of infrastructure collapsing in places like Montreal, um, where uh, infrastructure was allowed to keep getting older and older and older because councils were reluctant to, in, to make the major investments. So what has happened across the country is an initiative to improve what we call asset management, properly planning for the replacement of major pieces of infrastructure. I mentioned our, our pipes earlier, an example of that. And I think it's about a quarter of our pipes are particularly in coming to the end of their lifespan and really thinking about how do you replace those in a way that doesn't overburden taxpayers but also doesn't lead to crisis? And I would say that we are on phase three in most areas of our asset management uh, uh, policy adoption and there are four phases. So that's work that continues and we really thank our finance department and our public works and engineering department who are working collaboratively on that. One of the major things, and again, it's not terribly sexy, is the uh, restoration of our long-term reserves. So council made the decision this year to uh, add a half percent to those and then every year for the next, I think it's the next four years, one percent. Uh, Mike, uh, that's the right, the right number, one percent every year for the next four years to bolster those reserves, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, the other thing that was important is that Mission had this um, historical thing called the unfunded projects list, uh, which really was a list of dreams and aspirations waiting for granting opportunities and it wasn't uh, very um, it wasn't a very strategic approach to looking at our, our, our projects and our growth needs. So leadership in our planning department and from council has led to a really nice approach to this where we've asked 
staff to take a realistic look over a 10-year period about what really are priorities for us and how we will fund them and when. And that funding can include things like charges that we um, uh, get from fees or from development cost charges and community amenity contributions, taxing and even borrowing and looking at which of those make sense. So that process is, is part way through and um, I know we have more work to do here in the next month or two to, to, to really look at it in an in-depth way, but um, that work is, is a significant one. We are on budget. Uh, when I gave a speech similar to this uh, previous to Christmas, we were at 1.92% below our projected budget. Snow may have made that a little closer to right on target, but um, uh, we, are, we are where we need to be in terms of operational expenditures. Um, some of the things that are coming up, I mentioned it earlier, when uh, developers want to develop land, they are asked to pay what's called a DCC and a CAC, a development cost charge and a community amenity contribution. These go to things like sewer, roads, um, parks and so forth. That policy needs to be updated as we all know the cost of land and the cost of materials is going up. So making sure we find that number that's not going to unfairly burdened developers is part of the work we're doing, but also means that taxpayers are not paying more than they should. And this is essentially um, a way of making sure that when developers promote growth, they pay for the added capacity we need. And I'll be speaking with each member of council. I'm hearing lots of feedback in our community about rationalizing or simplifying some of the practices we have around our business licenses. So I'll be having lots of conversations with council about that in the coming weeks. Uh, I spoke a lot before I was elected about community wellness and uh, one of the things I'm most excited about and it should come to us at our first meeting in February is affordable housing strategy. This isn't a strategy just about housing for people who are in the, in the poverty category but also for people who are uh, wanting to find housing across a spectrum. For example, or a senior that wants to stay in mission and downsize, or a young couple that wants to start off in a townhome. Uh, so we're trying to work with developers in our sustainable housing committee to have a strategy that's realistic and isn't always about uh, a taxpayer paying for these options. Uh, in fact, one of the things we've really uh, seen a lot of success with is our policy around creating housing agreements in exchange for density bonuses. And the way this works is that when developers agree to give 10% of their housing uh, in a development over to uh, a housing agreement that keeps the prices low uh, for a specified window of time of at least 10 years, they are able to add to the housing stock that they can get on their property. It's been a win-win. We've had a number of people take this on and I think you'll see that policy even expand more to meet other needs. As you may have heard, we're going to be doing supportive housing on Heard Street at 7460. Heard Street, we're going through a process of environmental review on that property. I'll be honest with you and tell you that's slowed it down in a way that I find frustrating, but we're doing what we can to expedite that and we'll have to be working, we are working with other community agencies to find other spots where we can house. In particular, uh, I would say we're looking at three particular groups. One of them is uh, our youth who don't have a safe place to live. Another are families or women in transition, specifically usually women and often they have children who are fleeing abusive homes or homes where there are issues with mental health or addiction. And then the third one, we've been talking with the Aboriginal Housing Management Association about whether there are ways for us to bring more housing projects for people of Indigenous descent living in an urban setting. Uh, I talked about before I was elected, restoring the Mission Healthy Community Council. This is a big table group that includes healthcare providers, social agencies, first responders, and we have reconvened that group and it's already paying dividends in terms of us taking a coordinated approach. And one of the biggest ways is we've undertaken already a community wellness strategic plan. And that plan will look at our health care, it'll look at our housing needs, it'll look at food security, uh, just to name a few areas that we're working on and that will continue through 2022. Myself and Councillor Hamilton sit on the Fraser Valley Regional District and the Regional Hospital District and we've both been advocating strongly to make sure that services come to mission as we are growing and our needs continue. And you saw an example of a remarkable collaboration between Fraser Health, the province, the Mission Altogether for Healthcare, the community, uh, Fraser Valley Healthcare Foundation with the investment and the province 
uh, in the CAT scanner. Uh, and that's going to be an investment by the time you include the cost of renovating the building as well as the machine of about $10 million that's going to be built into Mission Memorial Hospital over the coming year. My perspective, the council's perspective, is that's just a start for us. And we're going to continue to advocate for that. And as I said, Councillor Hamilton and I have been a voice for that already at the hospital district and will continue to do so. Uh, in early March, watch. If you want to find out about things like this, sign up at engage.mission.ca for the dates. But we are looking at hosting a homelessness forum. We're hearing more and more, and I'm sure we'll have questions tonight about homelessness. Um, we want to have a symposium where all the service providers are working to improve the way they coordinate and to learn from each other and also to address your questions and let you know what's going on. And as I mentioned, trying to increase the housing stock while supportive and affordable. Engagement, um, I want to make sure that you uh, are clear on what we're doing around engagement in mission. It's been a huge priority for me. It, COVID has made it challenging, but I have to say a huge thanks to our, our communication staff, Annie, Claire, and Taryn, for the work they've done to make sure that our digital platform is a way to hear from you. And we have done that a lot over the last year. Silverdale, utilities master planning, transportation master planning, greenway, budget, waterfront, what have I forgotten, Taryn? What color should the building be painted? I don't know, but we've had a lot and we can't thank you enough. We know that answering surveys is not the most fun thing, but we're looking at ways to even make that better with video and interactivity. Um, and, uh, and so we appreciate that. The community conversations initiative is one we've been trying to get happening. Again, I hate to use the excuse of COVID. We had set a date of doing one, hopefully at Stave Falls Elementary at the end of January, with the topic being North Mission. It looks like COVID will keep us from being able to do it in person to start off, but we'll use engage.mission.ca, we'll use Zoom, and then when we get the chance to be in person, we'll convene with the community up there. We're also planning these town hall sessions with subjects like the downtown, arts and culture, uh, parks and recreation and transportation. So you'll hear more of these. If COVID allows us to do them in person, I think everybody on council is keen to do that. You will also have an opportunity to have council, uh, so coffee with council thanks to an initiative we've undertaken. So our first three councillors, Mike, I'm gonna put you on the spot. You know who the first three councillors are for January? It goes by alphabetical order, so. Okay. Uh, alphabetical Daisy. order. Alphabetical order, correct. All right. Um, Ah, uh, I, I stumped you. That's all right. So it's on our website and we'll put it on our Facebook page. But every month, council, three councillors are going to meet with members of the community at a local coffee shop. Coffee will be on us and you'll have an opportunity to bend the ear of a council in a much more intimate, sort of familiar way, one-to-one, -one, ask questions, get suggestions, and those councillors will alternate on a regular basis. And again, sign up through our website and find out where they are. This session is an example of us trying to be innovative around engagement. And another thing I want to talk about is the investment the council made in this last year to the technology in council chambers. So whether you're calling in to be a part of a public hearing or a delegation, or whether you're just trying to see something in the form of a conversation to hear clearly and see clearly what the council had to say on a particular issue, the technology has been upgraded substantially. If you go and look at a set of minutes or an agenda, they will link to the video after the meeting is done and you'll be able to see exactly the portion of the conversation where something was discussed and you'll know exactly who to applaud and who to be angry at. Um, and then uh, what's coming up? Well, as you heard last year, the District of Mission has become the City of Mission. And it's a, been an opportunity for us to really acknowledge the need for us to go back and talk to the community about the way we want to define ourselves. I'm not sure the word branding is really the word we want to use. We've heard from citizens and businesses that they see this as an opportunity to do more than just talk about our logo or our tagline, but really to help define and vision what we mean by mission. I'm excited about this and I really want you to be excited and more importantly to be engaged as we go forward in defining what we mean by mission so it's built right into everything we do from the way we market ourselves to the policies we create and the money that we spend on your behalf. And as I mentioned earlier, engaging with First Nations will also be a real priority. And I've got a meeting coming up with one local band here in the next little while, and we'll be continuing to try and do more of those. So now, time for us to get the questions. We've got a lot of questions. Good, excellent. So these questions, uh, we've, we've had three or four questions that are questions that were sent in. 
please try to make sure your questions fit into one of these categories. If there are questions about policy or about council direction, I'll answer them as best I can in the moment. Technical question, we'll try to give you a quick answer or refer it to staff. If you've got feedback and comments, we'll take them and pass them on to council. So here are some questions that were sent in. I'm gonna actually get off this screen and just try to be a person here now. All right, I apologize. I don't know what happened there. We were having it. We did a test run yesterday and then for some reason when we ended the screen share, it closed us off. But we're back and everything you wrote under the other post, Taryn has captured and uh, we will have it. So don't worry about it. You don't need to retype those questions. Uh, the four questions I want to answer that were sent in. Uh, the first question, I'll let people get online. Oh my gosh, there's only one person online right now watching this. Oh, we're up to 11 already. All right, so here are some of the questions that were asked in advance. The first question is, many of you uh, received in the first week of January your BC assessment uh, documents and saw a large increase in the value of your property. And so we were asked, and we get asked this question fairly routinely, what impact is there on my taxes if my, properties, uh, if my property increases in value? And the answer to that question really has to do with the amount that your property increases in value. And you're going to really hate me because I'm going to make you get out your calculators. Uh, you'll have to figure out the percentage of increase in this year's assessment compared to last year's assessment to be able to figure out whether what I'm about to say makes a difference on your taxes or not. Missions uh, residential property values went up on average 37%. If your value went up by more than 37%, yes, that has an impact on your taxes. And I believe the number I got from staff was, let me see if I can grab it here, $16 or $15.50 or something uh, in impact for every percent if you, are, uh, if you have a home that is uh, worth $750,000. Um, and if you were below 37%, again, it'll have an impact on your taxes in a desirable way. So most people are going to increase by roughly about the average. But for those of us who live in areas like Silverdale, I have to tell you, um, it's going to have an impact that uh, I'm not looking forward to on my taxes. And so I appreciate the fact that it's something that may affect yours in that way as well. If you do not agree with your tax assessment, there is a process for appealing it. It's included in the mailer, or you can go to BC Assessment's website and appeal to them. It's a provincial process. It's one that's done by a government, a provincial government agency, and I would encourage you, if you're concerned about your assessment, to use that appeal process. Uh, we don't have that information in, in, in when we do budgeting, and it really is not possible for us to incorporate it that way. Second question we were asked is really about vaccine ma mandates, and I guess there's two ways the question has been asked. Question number one was, what, um, what is the city going to enforce the, the vaccine mandate uh, and the impact it has on access to things like the gym and the swimming pool at the Leisure Centre? And the second question was about whether there was some way that uh, those who were not vaccinated, who chose not to get vaccinated, or who couldn't get vaccinated, could be reimbursed some portion of their taxes uh, for the Leisure Centre. The answers to those questions are yes, we're going to uphold the policy and no there is no way to refund taxes. Let me explain why. The provincial government uh, doesn't ask the city for input in designing these policies. We don't get that information any faster than you do or have any input in it. And it's probably better that that's the case because cities are not, uh, they don't employ healthcare experts or scientists. And so we really are just like any other public entity out there, any restaurant or any private gym, we have really no choice but to enforce the policies that are passed down. It's actually a mandate in the legislation that allows municipalities to exist, like the Local Government Act and the Community Charter. So we really are um, in no different position than the rest of the citizenry. And when the health orders change and allow us to adjust and, and to reopen access to folks, we'll do that, just as we have adjusted to everything else along the way. The other part of that question is about reimbursing some sort of tax savings, but I would point out to folks a couple of things. First of all, there isn't a tax savings because the Leisure Center is operating. So the Leisure Center hasn't closed as a result of this. About 80% of the community is vaccinated and has a passport and are continuing to use the facility. So of course uh, it remains open. But even more than that, there really isn't any way that we would know 
how much we would be able to uh, assign to any particular people. There's no way to do that calculation when you think about it. And of course, people's vaccine status isn't something that I have at hand or should have at hand. So it becomes an impossible request and one that would probably cost more than any savings we might imagine. And the other thing is there really is no way for us as Canadians to opt out of the policies, the taxation that we don't agree with. Some folks have compared it to our sewer system and our water system. Those are not funded through the taxes. Those are funded through user fees. A leisure centre is interesting because it's funded through a combination of user fees and taxes. So if you're not using the facility right now, you're not paying the user fees, if you have subscribed to swimming lessons or bought a pass, then you're entitled to a refund, a credit or an extension, those things, and the city will happily do that for you. Here's the thing. I think these questions are really about people's feeling around the policy in general. And I have empathy and a strong respect for the fact that people need to have their rights respected. I'm not going to get into my personal opinions here because frankly, I'm not an expert. But I am going to say to people that if you disagree with the provincial policy, then advocate to the provincial government because that is where the decisions are coming from. I, at this point, I'm just like every other person in the community and I completely understand some of the challenges that we're all experiencing, especially after many of us had high hopes over Christmas that we'd be able to take a break, spend time with family, and here we go again. So it's been exhausting and it's been really impacting on many of the things we value most in our lives. So if you have concerns about the policy, I would strongly recommend that you take that advocacy to the provincial government. Uh, the next question was about Mission Raceway Park. That's the other one we got. What's its future? I can answer this one concisely. The future of Mission Raceway Park is completely up to them. Um, in terms of the raceway and the collaboration we have around the waterfront, they've been a partner in that. They've been fantastic to work with. The preferred land use plan leaves space for them to do what they want. And in the conversations we've had, what's been exciting is that we're talking potentially about seeing the raceway actually um, become a, an entertainment venue with even more opportunities. So um, the, the raceway legally and morally and in every way has its own right over its own property as does anybody else. And the city has no entertain is, is simply not interested in trying to do anything to compromise that. Last question that was asked in ahead at a time is what's up with the snow clearing? Um, I'll tell you this, folks, we had anywhere from six to 10 trucks working almost 24 hours a day through the last, through the 17 days, roughly from uh, Christmas Eve all the way until the other day last Sunday when we finally saw some sunshine. They were out dealing with impacted snow, freezing rain, and temperatures that made salt work far less effectively than, us than usual. And when the snow was falling, we condensed the routes to go to those major traffic routes. So the traffic situation, if you're on uh, one of those secondary or tertiary routes, is definitely a challenging one. And particularly, we heard from folks, pedestrians, who found it difficult because the policy the city has around sn shoveling snow from sidewalks has its limits. And I guess that's the answer to the question. Our uh, infrastructure has its limits. And so I understand the frustration that people have. I don't ever want to minimize it. I live out in the country and I certainly had difficulty. I just stayed home for the few days as well. And luckily I was able to do that. And I know some folks can't. But the reality is that uh, I can tell you our staff were incredibly committed. Um, they took time away from their family and they were out there everywhere. If this happens in the future and you're getting missed, you think you're getting missed, call 604-820-3761. That's the 24 hour, seven day a week public works line. Email me if you can't get through and let me know what you're seeing. But I can tell you our staff were paying close attention to taking an analytical approach and that council will be debriefing and seeing what we can improve on when we come to the end of the snowy season. I know people are frustrated by it and I know it's a safety concern, um, but I can tell you, uh, we are, we, we do, simply put, are doing our best out there. All right, those are the four questions that we had ahead of time. Now we get to take the live ones. Okay. Taryn, hit me. Uh, just on the snow, there was one, there was a few questions about accessibility on sidewalks. Um, concerns that folks that may be in a, in a wheelchair would yep. be able to um, maybe update on that. And then also uh, adding to the snow, concern over growth of the mission and okay. being able to keep up with new roads. Excellent. So in case you couldn't hear that in the background, the question was about pedestrian safety and also about what growth impacts will be on snow clearing. So pedestrian safety is one that I think we are going to have to evolve on. Our policy right now has been to ask 
homeowners and business owners to shovel the area in front of their businesses and homes. But there are a number of challenges with that. For example, when businesses were closed over Christmas, when a lot is vacant, or when the homeowner is a senior or a disabled person, those aren't realistic answers to the questions. And there's this kind of unclear area, what happens with the wider boulevards or with things like bus stops. So that's part of what I expect, and I know other councillors, I know Councillor Gill and I were speaking the other day, uh, I think there's a few of us who are going to want to take a look at whether or not we need to do more to add that capacity. We had to do that on Cedar, uh, the Cedar Connector, a few years ago because of the slope. And I think this fits into the question around growth as well. If we're going to add things like greenways, we're going to need new ways to look at how we can clear those because they're not going to be suited to typical plows. So I'm going to be bringing that forward. I know other members of council have it in their mind as well. It'll be a topic of conversation as we come through the end of the snowy season and we'll look at what's going to be possible in the coming years. It's going to probably involve some investment in some technology and person power. Um, okay. Next question. Uh, so in light of the major flooding that we saw in November, particularly in Abbotsford, um, do you have any updates on a siphon system in um, Hapsic or any other areas? What's the commission's position? Well, I can tell you that it's certainly a very hot topic provincially. It's a very hot topic. Oh, the question, in case you couldn't hear, was any updates on what's happening around diking? I should make sure I repeat them. Don't let me forget that, Taryn. Um, so it's a hot topic, the conversation of diking provincially and at the region. And I'll tell you specifically why. For quite some time, the province had decided that diking would be the issue of local government. But when you look at the Fraser Valley, we have just over 300,000 people living in the area, basically um, west or east of 287th out here on the north side of the Fraser and the border between Alder Grove and Abbotsford on the south. And that just isn't enough of a tax base, particularly in electoral areas like out in DeRoche and Dudney, where there's a lot of what we call orphaned dikes or dikes that are at an agricultural standard. In other words, they're too small and they have gaps in them. So it was really good to hear the province acknowledge that they need to revise that policy. I've had conversations uh, with our MP as recently as yesterday with Mayor Braun over in Abbotsford, with the chair of the regional district, Jason Lum, as well as with our MLA, Pam Alexis, as recently as today. And I think everybody agrees that we're going to have to probably see some infrastructure investment. What that will look like, I don't think we can answer that as quickly as I would like it to be answered because it's, uh, it, it's only something that's a few months old, or at least the most recent occurrences. But uh, if you're wondering what myself and council are likely to be advocating for, I think we need to be strong advocates for it, and particularly with our waterfront being something that we are focused on. So we've talked about something called the super dike, and it's actually right in the waterfront plan that this dike would be, would be built there, and then the actual lands on the north side of the dike would be raised as well. So. It is a key area of concern and we will definitely be keeping people up to date. It's part of what I'm advocating for right now and we'll continue to do so. Okay, and we have we had a few questions about traffic and street improvements mm -hmm. the um, So any updates on the Wren Street repair um, and Keystone at Hayward? Um, the local residents a local resident says the road closures have been inconvenient. Okay, let's talk about them in a few different sets. I'm going to talk about the two that were asked, and I'm going to add a third one. Mike, can you talk about where we are? Do you want to come over here and be on cam yeah, camera? Fine, and just talk a little bit about, uh, come right in front, Mike, and talk a little bit about what's happening at Wren and Tyler where the uh, road was uh, affected by the rains. Yeah, so that, um, that the, the timing is unfortunate because the uh, a lot of the offices that we require, the engineering assistance, were closed over the holidays, obviously. but. And then the, the consultant we chose, uh, their whole office got COVID. So we are uh, expecting the engineered drawings within the next two weeks. And we can't say what the timing is on the reconstruction until we see those drawings and see the extent of work required. There could be a lot of removal of the existing road and a lot of retaining wall elements that are required. That road is a very, very old road, built more or less like a logging road. So it was not designed for, for uh, like a, a normal uh, municipal road is these days. So. Hopefully we'll have, uh, we, have a, we have a page, the Ren Street Project page on the website that we keep up to date. And hopefully we'll have an update um, in a week or two when the construction will be uh, started and, and hopefully finished. 
and before I'll just speak while I'm off camera, don't go away because I'm going to ask you about another one. But I think the other thing that was good news, uh, a little bit of good news, was that we were optimistic or hopeful that it would be just the road and not the infrastructure, the sewer services and so forth below it. And that actually survived the rain, uh, maybe fortuitously, this, this most recent time. Yeah, it survived, but it will have to be replaced as well with the, with the road because the elevation we expect is going to change slightly on that okay. road. Okay. Now, the other one is about Keystone Bridge, and I know a little bit about this myself. Let me squeeze in with you here. Don't go away, Mike. You're masked, and I'm, I've already had COVID, so we're good. Um, but uh, uh, the Keystone Bridge is open. I travel over it every day myself, back and forth to, to the office. Uh, but there are times it's to one lane. What happened was that the um, there was an adhesive that needed to be applied, from what I understand. Michael, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and it needed three forecasted days of dry weather. And as we all know, uh, dry weather was in very short supply in November and December. So our public works department worked with the um, uh, company that built it, I believe they're called Hanna Infrastructure, and worked with them to make sure that they were doing what they could. So what they did is they actually completed the bridge so that it could be used, and they're gonna do a lot of the other work by doing one lane closure. And I think we have to actually probably do a short closure again once the weather dries up. Anything to add to that, Mike? No, just that uh, I believe there's some Fortis uh, work that has to be done as well, which is uh, leading to one of the lane closures. Right, exactly. So I see that when I go by, it's Fortis and other companies that are making sure that that's there. So thank you, Mike. The other one I'll talk about is, um, wasn't in the question, but what's happening with, uh, I get asked all the time about the overpass, Glasgow and Murray overpass. Is that a question there as well? Excellent. In fact, I had this conversation with Pam Alexis, our MLA today as well. Folks, uh, I'll be. I'll put it to you this way. Um, I think Pam said it to me best. We're, the ambition is to build back better. I'm not. After speaking with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, I don't think that the biggest investment for us is in a new Glasgow Murray overpass. I think the better investment for us to be working towards is a proper bypass that would likely intersect near the area of Stave Lake Street and go down on our flats that way it'd be a stimulus for the waterfront to develop as well as be a safer and better uh, intersection all around and and take some of that traffic out of uh, the area of the downtown there uh, in the first place the piece of infrastructure itself is safe but it is ugly and it falls apart and it gets potholes very easily because when it was designed they thought they were being innovative by putting heaters into the road but what that did the heaters long ago stopped functioning and um, as a result, this thinner pavement keeps getting chipped off, especially with trucks going over it. The solution in the shorter term is to keep patching it, but that's not the long-term solution. And as I said to Pam today, and we both agreed, it's about pinning down some kind of a actual answer for the future. In the shorter term, one of the things we've been working on and our communications people have been helping with, thank Claire for this, Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure said as a first step for us that they're interested in seeing trucks rooted uh, working with us to see trucks rooted off First Avenue and down that way. So there's been a civic engagement process that Claire has just wrapped up and we're working with the ministry. It will require an improvement to that intersection in terms of the um, stacking lane and so forth. But uh, the reality is, frankly, I don't want to put um, uh, money into something that is probably old technology. I'd much rather see us ask the ministry to focus on doing something that improves that eastern access I've spoken of, and even widening the road east of that, where traffic often backs up. And on the other side of it, Highway 11, Highway 7, and Cedar Connector, that intersection needs to be improved. And that's the focus of the conversations I've been having and council's been having with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. I think those are the main ones that come to mind. Taryn, yes. what's next for us? Um, we have some questions about uh, roads and streets. So how is Mission preparing to accommodate for new growth to ensure that it's not just congestion everywhere? Mm -hmm. um, and how do we decide where to put lights and intersections? Um, how is that preparing? Perfect. Uh, one of the things I just spoke about is one of them because Dave Lake Street's a major uh, ingress egress road out of Mission and I have significant concerns about the intersection at the southernmost junction of that road with Highway 7. So that I've just spoken about a moment ago. It's going to be a key idea for us to improve that intersection and hopefully allow it to be a bypass. So if people want to get 
on a southern route. They could do it directly. If they want to head west, they can be on a bypass. That's a key area for me. Another one that I want to remind people I mentioned earlier, if you weren't tuned in, is that we've just invested in some public uh, works folks, and specifically a traffic technologist adding to that capacity. And we are undertaking two traffic studies with ICBC right now in two areas, and we'll need to continue doing that. And then finally, our transportation master plan is coming to uh, council for final approval here in the next few months. And I think, Taryn, there's an, one last civic engagement opportunity, or is are we at the point of wrapping up on the last one? Can you can you think of the answer? It's, it's um, it, it's finalized, and the updated and finalized draft will be presented. So okay, great. So your input has been incorporated already, and so that strategic approach to transportation, transit, and uh, and safety is built right into the plan. That's the whole reason for the plan to to really answer the question you just asked. Uh, okay. Next, housing. Housing. Any questions on housing? Question about the new building staff that you. Mm -hmm. update. Uh, will those people be looking at the building as a development process to help increase housing stock? Um, and really, many questions about affordability. Sure. Are people being outbid, rents are too high. Yeah, they are. Uh, rents are too high. The question, if you couldn't hear, Taryn, was about the capacity of our new staff to deal with the crunch on um, housing stock, housing affordability, and so forth. So the building officials that we have, uh, the building official that we've added and the other staff in that department, the plan checker and the admin assistant, they're really meant to help uh, get that process of, pro of, of dealing with building permits to be a much more smooth one. So doing that will help us to, to build things more quickly and particularly we want to have, we've given people a specific stream for industrial and commercial developments, ones that produce jobs, as well as for institutional uh, things like schools and, and, uh, and public buildings, as well as for multifamily developments like apartments, right Mike? That's, that's the sort of thing, right? And so that's a key area for us to give some streamlining to because those tend to be the most affordable options and they give us the most bang for our buck on a piece of property. Uh, the other thing that we've done, as I mentioned, is that we have a council, uh, we budgeted for what we're calling a housing coordinator and we have an affordable housing strategy. I expect it'll be implemented, uh, voted and supported on uh, the first meeting of the first February council meeting. And we've already approved the application of, a, of what we call a housing coordinator who helped to bring in these policies and work with developers to make sure that we are um, uh, being innovative. They're, they're, I'll be telling you right now, ambitious goals. Some folks might think they're too ambitious, but I'd rather aim high and uh, get as close to those goals as we can. But uh, that's a huge priority for all of us. Uh, it isn't in the question, but I'll add to it anyways. It's not just about finding housing across the spectrum, but we know that some folks need certain supports in the community. They need to have them in their housing or close to their housing, and that's also an area of focus. And that's why the Community Wellness Committee, or the, sorry, now Mission Healthy Community Council, is working on a community wellness strategic plan so that we are actually making sure that we're uh, putting resources where they're gonna make the biggest difference for people so that once they find housing, they can continue to move forward in their lives and be stable and for us to have neighborhoods where everybody is functioning effectively. Okay, a couple more questions about development. Um, has the city considered updating community amenity contributions as a way to fund for more services? Yes, it's in. The question asked was, does the city consider uh, uh, updating community amenity contributions? Yes, uh, it is happening right now. Council's already had, I think, two workshops on it. We're coming up to our third one and development cost charges, but that work will be development cost charges in the same kind of category of asking developers to pay for the increases in growth and the capacity that we need. So yes, that's happening right now as we speak, and I would expect that process to be wrapped up in the next few months. Mike, do you remember at the top of your head what the timeline is for that one in terms of when it's likely to be done, or can we at least post that later on? Yeah, we, can post it. we can maybe put a timeline up for you on our Facebook page or engagewestmission.ca, and I think you'll have opportunities to see and comment on some of these other uh, initiatives that are going on out there. So when we do this, for example, if you are a person who's thinking about building a home, we are gonna be talking to people who are on that side of the equation about things as well. So we don't do it without getting some input, but yes, definitely being evaluated. Okay. And also with development, um, has the city considered stopping um, approving large developments until infrastructure can catch up um, and meet the needs of people that are already here? Uh, the question we were asked is, has the city thought about stopping large developments until infrastructure can catch up? Um, 
I'll be pretty blunt about this. Um, it's a, a, the answer is we can't. I think that the it's important to understand something and I get this probably the most common question I get from people or perhaps most common uh, misconception about how council operates. Council doesn't drive development, council has to respond to development and um, the intrinsic thing in the question is doesn't council see the importance of having infrastructure and social services and schools and healthcare uh, work alongside of of uh, and keep up with growth and yes the answer to that is yes and that's why I talked about the planning including the financial planning so that's the secret for us the challenge is really about working with other branches of government when it comes to schools and hospitals and I can tell you um, I am in council is uh, very very um, fixated uh, maybe a word and persistent in our advocacy and we're lucky because right now I think we have the ear of our two MLAs Bob Deeth and Pam Alexis, and they're really working hard with us, as is our, our federal uh, MP. But there's really no way to say to developers, we're not taking development. That's just something that's not really allowed under the law because people have property rights. What we do instead is a couple of very important things. First, we try to make sure that our official community plan is robust and makes sense in the context of what the community cares about. Things like form and character, environmental values, traffic safety and services and that's why it's so important to review it and as I said I can tell you um, council understands that it's it's probably at a point where it needs to be reviewed we've had eight year review periods the last two times and we're at five years and I think we're all starting to realize that even five years uh, has gone by quickly here the other part of it is asking developers to make sure that rather than just a public hearing process where people have to stand up and oppose or express concerns, we're much more interested in dialogue and asking developers to work with neighbors to build in the things that they care about, the social values, the environmental values, the form and character values, and to help pay for the programs we want. And that's that question we had a few moments ago about community amenity contributions, and it's also the question we had a few moments ago about, uh, about things like housing and having density bonusing. And one last thing that I'll say about this is that we really achieve a lot of what people are asking for here by actually having a particular type of development, industrial and commercial development. The mill rate or the type of taxation that those places pay is considerably higher than a residential development. And so every time we build something that's institutional, commercial or industrial, it benefits us in two ways. First, it gives people an opportunity to make an income and to not have to spend a lot of money getting to their job, but also those are a source of revenue for our tax base that makes us have a far better opportunity to afford the sort of growth related uh, programming and resources that the question includes. Uh, Bob Deeth has joined us. Oh, He's on, in the comments. So hello Bob, welcome and thank you for joining us and thank you for all of your work uh, that you're doing with us and, and our ongoing collaboration. Okay, we have a question about the Rainy Well Project. Um, ah. Is it on budget and when will it come online? The Rainy Well Project, I, 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 I'm I not sure I'm understanding specifically which one that is. That's a name I'm not familiar with. Are they talking about the wells in Abbotsford? Yep. Ah, thank you very much. So the the Well Project in Abbotsford has been a source of challenge and frustration for, for, for Mayor Braun and I and both of our councils. Um, and we've done some advocacy at provincial and federal levels. And here's what we, where we were we were at a point where we were talking about having collector wells and now we're at a point where we're talking about a series of smaller wells which is probably a more viable plan um, and so that's what we're working on right now and moving forward and I have to thank again our MLAs who went and did a little bit of legwork for us and what they did is they talked to the agencies at the province that helped to fund these programs and said what is it that really makes a good application tick and we talked a lot about growth but in fact what I think the government at the provincial level is mostly interested in are things like environmental sustainability, adapting to climate change, and making sure that our water source is one that is um, is not going to have a negative impact. And that's what I like about the well project in either of the, the two forms, the collector wells or this smaller well approach. And so I'm optimistic this time, and um, Abbotsford has really put a lot of their expertise into it. But uh, I'll be honest with you and say I don't have any guarantees. It's work we're continuing to move on in. I feel the same pain as the questioner that this is really vital if we're going to continue to keep up 
with uh, our water needs in both of our communities. Okay, next question. Was there an effort to cut property taxes in 2022? There's no effort to cut, the question is, was there an effort to cut property taxes? Um, the effort to cut property taxes, no. There's, there wasn't an effort to try and reduce property taxes, and I'll explain why. There was an effort to try and limit property taxes. There always is. The maintenance of services on its own would have been a 3.5% tax increase. So to cut services, if you imagine we went to zero, it's the same as saying you have to cut 3.5% of value in your services. And as we've talked about so often through this evening's presentation, there really is no way to imagine our community actually having less services. And to be honest with you, um, I think it hurts our community that we have often had that sort of limited thinking. I take a business approach to things like this, and I think that businesses don't only look to save, they often look to invest. They look at both sides of the ledger and think about where does investment pay a dividend down the line? So you'll often hear me talk about the business case for expenditures, and that's what I think council had to do here. So. We were very lucky to have our staff, they're always excellent, but particularly this year, they had everything very sharpened pencils at the beginning of this whole process. So I know that there were some folks who talked a little bit about that, but for the most part, council said, we want to make sure that we are equipping our community to be ready for growth in the future and to meet the needs of our community even right now. So uh, it was about keeping taxes at a reasonable level, not cutting. Now, shifting to the waterfront, Uh, the question, if you didn't hear it, was, is there a commitment to residential on the waterfront? Could it be taken off the table? I don't think there's, at this point, the community is still going to have one more opportunity to look at the waterfront plan, so I want to point that out. Council hasn't raised our hand and said yes or no, but the plan includes waterfront residential, particularly to the east, and uh, I haven't heard anybody on the council or in community say that they don't have um, a, a spot for that or a place for that. We know that if there's going to be commercial enterprises down there, they need to have a critical mass of people who live in the area and will want to uh, shop and eat and do those sorts of things. It'll be part of what creates the buzz down there. So it won't, uh, it'll be a mixed neighborhood. I think you'll see a combined use of commercial, residential, industrial and institutional uses, parks and public spaces, um, and of course, infrastructure like roads through the network and, and trans transit exchanges. So it's going to have everything in my, and including uh, some, some exciting innovations, I think, down there. Okay. Now, some economic development questions. What is the City of Michigan doing to attract small businesses to open their doors here? And what can the city do to attract more high paying um, and good paying manufacturing and industry jobs? Okay, so the question, if you didn't hear, is what are we doing to attract small businesses and what are we doing to uh, attract, and I'll say retain, uh, high value jobs as well? So one of the biggest things for us is increasing our employment land stock. So you may have noticed as you're heading west out of town um, between Silver Creek and Nelson, about 90 acres of property being prepared there. That will double the size of our existing business park. The waterfront itself will be a huge stimulus for opportunities uh, for um, commercial, industrial uh, enterprise down there. Um, I'm excited about some other things that are in the pipeline that um, I hope will come to the point where we can go to the community about them, but I can tell you that I have had a number of calls from um, very established industrial developers and commercial developers to help find jobs in our community. But I'll also answer the question this way and I'll say I think we can do even more and we need to do even more. So we talked earlier about things like uh, having a business license regime that is simple, uh, making sure our process is as appealing to people as possible. What I've found as a business person and working with businesses is that they really appreciate clarity and equity. It's not necessarily for them about not having to do any kind of work or pay any kind of taxes. It's about knowing that when they start to invest time and money, it's not going to be unnecessarily delayed or unnecessarily complicated or that they won't come across surprises down the pipeline. And so uh, I work very closely with our economic development office um, and I am incredibly supportive of what our development uh, liaison committee and our economic development committee are doing to try and work on this. And I think the more we can do, the better. I know that's not a very specific answer, but frankly, um, it's something I think we need to, to develop here, and uh, that'll be something I'll continue to work on. Okay, some public safety questions. Um, when will Mission have another staffed fire truck on the road? We currently only have one staffed 
fully staffed fire truck for your whole mission and we're growing? We don't have one fully staffed fire truck per se. I think we have one fully staffed fire station and they run one engine first, but of course we do have paid on call workers who come in, uh, firefighters who come into that station. Um, but yes, I think it is going to be critical for us to increase the number of staff in our fire department who are ready to respond. In particular, we're focused on adding another fire station in the Cedar Valley area that will respond to emergencies in that area. We have a strategic plan in that area and we're working on acquiring the land right now as the first step in that area. And I expect we'll have some more updates on that in the coming months. At least that's where I'm, we're targeting. Um, and that will be a budget thing over the next few years. And I think, uh, Mike, I don't know if you want to add anything to this, but we do have a strategic plan around our fire department. That's what I was going to say, the fire master plan fire master plan and uh, that can be posted online but I think council understands the need to make sure we have fire capacity in Cedar Valley and similarly reaching into the Silverdale neighborhoods as well so that is something that's in our planning um, but uh, we do need to do it in, in, in increments in gradual ways. Okay. Has Mission considered starting a community safety officer program that many other BC municipalities are doing to take burden off police? Um, that's an interesting one because for me, when I think about CSOs, CSOs that I know are CSOs that work on construction sites. So this person might have a slightly different definition. Mike, you look like you have something you can add there. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it, it is something that uh, many of you might know that our, in, our officer in charge of the RCMP detachment uh, recently retired. So there's a new inspector that will start in the next couple of months. And that's on our list to, to talk to the new inspector with. Okay, great. Yeah, we're going to be, Mike and I were talking yesterday with the RCMP about the recruitment process and the questions we get to ask, and that's that's a great one we'll take as a suggestion, mm -hmm. and I'll explore further because I don't know much about it, so we'll find out more. Okay, we have two questions about engagement. Mm -hmm. um, will there be a more meaningful community engagement on an environmental policy or mission? The previous um, attempt at a tree bylaw was not good, and it didn't speak to our unique city. Okay, great. So the question was, will there be an opportunity for meaningful engagement around our environmental policies? Uh, I love this question because it's one that I finally get to answer with a simple one word answer. Yes, uh, our environmental charter is coming before council here in the next little while. And I think it'll be in a draft form initially and it'll be a chance for a workshop. And I can tell you this elected person and council as a whole will strongly encourage, I think we already have it planned to be a community consultative a process. Consultation. Yeah, lots of consultation, Mike said. so. Um, yeah, that's a key one for us. We, it, uh, having a charter or a policy like that that doesn't have input from the community is a, a, literally a waste of paper and, and of energy. So for sure that's coming. Mike, do you know when the environmental charter is targeted to be before council in its first draft? Uh, the third or fourth week of February. Probably the third or fourth week of February. And again, I'll make a commitment to you that if you sign up to engage.mission.ca, when we are doing those engagement processes, it'll come out in the newsletter and you'll have opportunities to hear more about it there. Um, so uh, anything to add to that, Taryn, in terms of how people can be tuned into that process? That's the best way. Okay, that's the best way. Yeah. Great, excellent. And then the other engagement question was, um, why were the residents near um, the herd supportive housing project not consulted? Um, the, the property that uh, the uh, herd supportive housing project is going to go on is identified as a park on the sign, but it's actually already zoned as a as a con, uh, ICI zone, immersed in park institutional right. parks. Yeah. So there wasn't a public process in the typical way. The proponent in this case is um, is uh, BC Housing, and what we do in processes like that is we ask them to be engaged in public information processes, as which they they did in fact do, and. Um, as a council, we opened up uh, our opportunity and our, our comments from folks. I certainly heard from many people about it, so there was lots of opportunity for folks to do it that way, and I would welcome further comments. I'll point this out to folks, um, a couple of things. First of all, uh, residential projects are needed in our community, and they need to go uh, in residential areas. They cannot go into areas uh, where commercial and industrial opportunities are existing. It's not right for the people living in the complex and it's not right for the people working and doing business in those areas. Um, and it's land stock that's in very short supply. Um, but it's also important to understand that when these types of housing complexes are built, they have as a mandate, they have to find a good uh, sign a good neighbor agreement, they have to have a community advisory committee, and uh, there are terms and conditions and ongoing 
relational things. For example, where we've spoken with community services about making sure that um, residents will have to, to sign a contact agreement. They were not only okay with that, but frankly, that's something that they support strongly themselves. And providing services to people within those resources is also vital. So um, the project is, uh, is, is one where I feel that we have done some community consultation, but more importantly, we'll need to, it's not the community consultation in advance that really matters as much as the community consultation as it operates and making sure that the folks that are living and operating that facility are communicating and working well with neighbors. Great. Um, just some questions around supporting homeless, the homeless people in mission. Um, an update about that and also a comment and a question about the feeling um, that the province has downloaded a lot to local government regarding crime reduction, homelessness, just homelessness and emergency. Yep. And is mission working with higher levels to help with this? So you okay. can get that help. The, the question in a big way is really what's happening with homelessness, um, if you didn't hear it, uh, questions about harm reduction, questions about downloading and so forth. Um, I'll put it to you simply, I'm concerned and frustrated uh, by the scenario that I'm seeing in our community. And I'll tell you why. Uh, in a word, I see burnout happening. I see burnout happening of neighbors. I see burnout happening amongst businesses that uh, have either in, in the past been okay with or even allies of supportive housing complexes. I'm worried about the staff working in the complexes. I'm worried about healthcare responders. I'm worried about first responders because our system right now isn't thinking about what next. So it was clearly important for us to address the need to house people. It's always been important and it's a bit disturbing for me personally, and I'm speaking very frankly, that it wasn't until COVID came along that suddenly and overnight we found spaces for people. And I know we did that largely to keep the community at large safe from COVID, but in order to do that, we had to be suddenly very resourceful. Um, I wish we had been more resourceful in a thoughtful way, and I'm gonna be continuing to push for an approach that thinks about where we have programming so that it's not all in one neighborhood, it's scattered and people have an opportunity to live in a way that isn't what I call ghettoized or institutionalized. That there are programs within facilities and nearby facilities where we're partnering also with community in-reach professionals like doctors, social workers and programmers. And that we are making sure that we actually work with people in what we call a case management model. One that works with individuals, build services around them and is with them in the longer term. I'll tell you bluntly, there isn't a single way that a person becomes homeless. There isn't a single way that people come out of being homeless. I've got lots of experience in this area from a therapeutic and professional approach. And I can tell you, it takes a team and it takes a longer term commitment. And when we keep trying to sweep things under the rug or have an out of sight, out of mind approach, what it does is make the problem worse. And then suddenly it becomes so bad that everybody can see it and it's having a conspicuous negative impact on our community. So almost everything about the system right now leaves me feeling frustrated and I know it makes people out there feeling frustrated. In fact, maybe one of the few things people can agree on is that the system isn't working. I always want to remind people that's affecting real people. It's affecting real people whether they're neighbors, it's affecting real people whether they work in the facilities, it's affecting real people that are homeless or hard to home or are unstably housed. And so we need to kind of think in a way that is uh, going to actually make neighborhoods better. That's not a lot of policy. I gotta tell you, I spoke to Pam Alexis today and I said, I'm interested in working at a provincial level if there's a table the sit and talk. I know that there's a mayor's forum that is working with, for example, large communities like Abbotsford. Um, we've been advocating for things like car 67s, which are cars that also have social workers in reach programs um, and uh, expanding uh, Mission Memorial Hospital have more mental health capacity. Those are three things I've been advocating for. Uh, but frankly, we're losing ground and I think we're losing ground dramatically. Harm reduction is a hot topic for a lot of people. Um, I'll tell you very bluntly, I think we all engage in harm reduction. You put your seatbelt on when you're driving a car, that's harm reduction in the bigger sense of the word. But you wouldn't put your seatbelt on and then think that allowed you to not pay attention to the way you were driving. So harm reduction is a part of a larger puzzle. You don't just say to people, hey, here's a safe place to utilize a substance. You have to then do something else, create programs for people, work with people, to actually move forward in their lives. Uh, and if they move from one program to another to provide transitional supports for folks along the way as well. 
I could have a whole evening on this one, and I plan that we will be doing that. I mentioned earlier a homeless forum coming up, I think, in early March, and, and then, frankly, I think that'll be just the first of many conversations. It's a big one for me, as you all know, and one that probably deserves uh, more than a few minutes of answering a question here and more listening to you. So, anyways, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, well, we have about five minutes left. Okay. Going by quickly. A couple questions about um, taxpayers. Um, so are taxpayers expected to subsidize developers, for instance, with sewer crossing going forward, are taxpayers subsidizing the growth of de developers? Okay, thanks. The question is, should taxpayers subsidize growth uh, or gro subsidize developers? Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier, that the council is reviewing development cost charges and community amenity contributions so that the balance is right. The answer is no, they shouldn't be. Uh, development cost charges and CACs are designed to pay for the growth that new development brings and taxpayers should be paying for the services that they're currently using. So uh, that's the whole idea of reviewing those fees. I think this is the question it's asking is does the double utility charge and I think there's also things like a garbage levy for homes that have suites in them is it about to, is it in, going to be reviewed I don't anticipate that the policy on secondary suites is going to be reviewed in the short term it's probably going to be part of a larger conversation in our affordable housing strategy frankly secondary suites from my perspective are an important part of making sure that a housing uh, affordable housing stock is in place and people can have their adult children living at home until they're ready to launch or their elder parents come and live with them but at the end of the day it's very difficult for the city to be able to tell the difference between a revenue generating property and a property that is uh, got a lock off suite for an aging relative um, at this point i don't anticipate council is going to be doing some kind of examination of those fees and the answer quite simply is we're focused on some other strategic areas at this time and we'll probably get to that at a later point but at this point i think the average secondary suite pro, uh, home is probably accurately paying that double cost. Um, next question, Taryn. Okay, um, another question about just um, scope and, and diversity of employment opportunities and mission. Uh, we, someone has observed that there's a lot of government um, employers, bigger employers in mission. What's being done to change that? What's being done, the question is what's being done to offer a wider array of opportunities for employment, especially living wage employment, and the question points out very accurately some of the largest employers in mission are government entities, the city and the school board in particular. I couldn't agree more and I think the focus needs to be, that's why you've heard me a number of times tonight talk about industrial and commercial uh, development, particularly industrial development because those are the jobs that pay the best and so expanding our employment lands is a big priority and offering opportunities for industrial developers to come and some of them I'm hoping will not only be along our highway because it was obviously a limited amount of that and so uh, those will be jobs in manufacturing, in trades uh, and so forth. So those are some of the areas that we're focusing on the U of V investment is exciting as well because those jobs are educators' jobs and there's training and education that will help people to go out and earn living wage jobs. So if you haven't heard this news, it's an $8 million investment by U of V in our Mission campus and uh, many programs coming over here, particularly those focused on, um, on education and human services. So we're really excited about that as well and we'll be working closely with them to make sure that they not only continue to do that but even add to their capacity here. Um, one about how have we partnered or looked at working with the Special Olympics to elect renewed our facilities, our all weather field for tournaments or Sure, absolutely. I, I suspect I know who's asked this question because we chat fairly often. So hello, Bryce, and <laughs> thank you for your advocacy. The question is, have we worked with um, Special Olympics or will we work with Special Olympics to make sure that the capacity uh, that they need is uh, that things like the, the gym at Heritage Park and so forth? And the answer is yes, I, I will continue to encourage our parks and recreation people to work with Special Olympics. Uh, you guys are have done us proud a lot of times in your competitions and um, and do something very valuable to uh, help people stay connected. So absolutely, the answer is yes. And if you have questions along the way with specific userships, then continue to do what you're doing. Write us, 
and we'll connect you up with uh, with Maureen. Uh, we're going to have um, some new leadership in that department in the coming year, and it'll be important for us to make sure that everybody that's coming on board uh, understands the partnership we've had with Special O. Okay, and what is your favorite race at Mission Raceway? My favorite? Oh, yeah, well, it's interesting. I really love the the... The guys, the street legal 604 guys, I really like them. And of course, everybody likes the door slammers. Uh, you know, I, I go down there every year and see those guys. But uh, I like it all. I even like the bracket racing. And I know there's a lot of folks who don't completely understand that. Somebody might even see me down there in my infinity and seeing if I can get it out to top speed. I want to see how, what the launch is in my, uh, in my performance hybrid. So you never know. I might be down there. Anyways, I like it all. I like it all. Except that guy with the pacer. That, don't let him on the racetrack anymore. Uh, Pam Alexis has joined us. Hello, hello, Emily Alexis. Thank you for joining us. I bet you she was on actually even earlier. She I think probably she, was. she just she's posted a link for, for folks. And excellent. Assessment. Excellent. So thank you for doing that, Pam. Pam's posted some links, and again, Pam and I have been talking. I think you'll have opportunities, perhaps, to even interact with us and other levels of government together. We. We talk all the time and um, we think it's great to have opportunities for mutual collaboration. So thank you, Pam. Thank you, Bob. Um, and uh, any last one questions? More question. Sure. One more about Diamond Head. Is it a permanent site or will it be shut down? Is the Diamond Head a permanent site? The answer to that question, the best of my understanding, is that it is not a permanent site. It's under, a, I think it's a lease agreement right now, Mike. Is that right? That ends at the end of, the current lease ends at the end of March. But but being realistic, it was signed so that they could manage the COVID situation. And I don't anticipate that March 31st is actually the exit from that particular facility. Uh, so I expect that it'll continue for a period of time there. But what I've said to uh, to our affordable uh, through our uh, manager of parks Rec uh, sorry manager of uh, social development, hello Kirsten, and to uh, our executive director of Michigan Community Services, hello Michelle, that I would love us as a community to start thinking about a place that can absorb capacity of folks. Those folks were living in the bushes. And so we want to make sure that we continue to provide them with services. But th I don't think that's the venue. I think we need to find a place that's actually going to be more, I would say, dignified as well as connected to services, as well as purpose built. So uh, I don't anticipate the Diamond Head itself will be a permanent fixture as it is. And I think that it ultimately actually will be an opportunity for an economic development on that piece of property. Perfect. Anything else? Well, folks, I really want to say thank you to you. First of all, I mean, we have 90 people. I think I counted at some point we are over 100 folks. The questions that people have been asking are fantastic. And the number one thing that I've learned about this is that we should do it again. Um, I, as I was going through my update, it was far too long because we haven't done it and too many things to cover in one night. But I think this is a vehicle that is worth trying again. And if you have thoughts, comments on the actual way it's been done and want to see more or don't want to see more, Please let us know. Uh, I want to remind you, uh, this community has always had a reputation of working as a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor community. That means dialogue. And right now, we are all incredibly stressed. We don't all agree on the issues, and some of them are pretty important ones. And what I see that makes me quite concerned is people just getting angry at each other. I don't really care whether your perspective and mine are the same. What I care about is that we show respect to each other and understand that each of those perspectives is mutually valuable. I want to encourage people to continue to talk to me, talk to our counselors. I have talked to every single one of them and they are eager to hear from you, as are our other branches of government. Please be good to one another and make sure that whether it's in the comments section here or on some other Facebook page, you're trying to stimulate ideas and collaboration, not just judgment and anger. Um, our community depends on it. Until we see you again, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you for the staff in the background who helped me with information and helped to make sure that we were able to do this. And I uh, will speak to you soon. Have a good evening, everybody.